Uh, hello, hello. So I'm the one that does need an introduction. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Roseanne Wakeley, uh, or Rosie for short. Uh, so I'm the designer in residence at the National Innovation Centre for Aging and at the Design Age Institute in London, part of the RCA. And I'm also uh, one of the founders of Rust and Squid. And we are a creative robotic company that bring together artists, engineers, and designers. And we actually create physical um, items that allow these people to work together. Um, so not just creating a design process, but physical tools that help engineers work with artists. So for instance, uh, if you're a puppeteer, we have a controller that allows puppeteers to control the robot, and then that can be plugged into a computer and give the coder the code so that they're sort of talking each other's languages. Um, and this is a heart that you can hold in your hand, wear a wristwatch, and it beats in time with your heartbeat. Um, with, um, and, and also you can have another heart that uh, shows different biomedical engineering data. Um, and this is a giant uh, 400 robotic books that open and close as people move in front of it, sort of like a swarm of bees. Uh, so talking about digital and libraries and the future of those two things. So that's my interest. So much, really. Um, yeah, just a quick one then. So I'm Carly Smith, uh, full-time academic, but also very interested in cyberdelics, altered states, and sound. Um, so why I'm interested in them about hacking, um, I think it's this idea that we don't really understand what being human is yet. So how, how on earth can we skip to other umbelts and sense like other umbelts? And there's lots of theories, a big history of what's it like to be a bat in philosophy. Um, but it's lots of, lots of, you know, cognition and not embodiment. So we're trying to bring prosthetics to the party. Uh, so the problem. So we've we found that humans believe that they are above nature. They think they're at the top of the hierarchy. They've got the ultimate intelligence. Um, we're you know, so smart, so clever. Um, <laughs> but this has resulted in us actually treating the environment quite badly. Like the environment is sort of separate and beneath us and sort of the background of our human achievements. I mean, not us, the other humans. <laughs> um, and also it sort of has alienated the neurodiverse uh, community, making them feel like they're less than and other than this sort of ultimate uh, human. Right, next slide. So yeah, just, just on that note, really, that we're not really living in a nest of ecology, or we don't perceive that nest of ecology, we just think we're at the top of the food chain. But humankind has not woven the web of life, we have but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things bound together, all things connect. So we think we throw things away, but there is no way. So yeah, just, just that sort of graphic, really, instead of us at the top of the pyramid, it's like that we are inside this, this nest of ecology. And we think we can build our hypothesis is that we can build much more compassion, empathy as well, although there's a big argument against empathy, uh, because if you, are, if you become the other, then you're kind of, you know, if you become a schizophrenic, to empathize with a schizophrenic, you're kind of in that same uh, disabled state. It's nice to have a window onto it, but it's sometimes it's, it's difficult to argue for empathy. But compassion, we believe, is, is the key here. Uh, so compassion between other, ourselves and other species, and if we can experience the umbel of another species, then maybe we would just have a little bit more compassion. Um, so we've chosen three kingdoms. So you've got the mycelium, uh, which you could argue is much, much, much more intelligent than us because it's you know, outlived five mass extinctions and we are causing the sixth. Um, um, octopus, or octopuses, not octopus, that's not right, apparently, but um, yeah, and forests. And our goal is to make play, uh, playful, physical, <coughs> a lot of the time very analog, not involving necessarily uh, electronics, but will um, in the future, uh, that create a bridge between these different modes of being. So our design process, we've we've gathered um, a big expert group. Uh, you, may, you may have heard of Merlin Sheldrake, for instance, brilliant book recently, Fantastic Lungi. So he's one of our, um, of our new parts of the group, so we're going to meet a few of them shortly. But, you know, these people that have spent a lot of time with octopus, um, for instance, and another expert that's, that we're just interviewing, we spent 30 years being with these creatures. So if you can get that kind of window, then, then that's, that's what we need. But you also look at all the other um, 
existing Umbelt hacking attempts. David Abrams is a, a very famous person uh, in this field. Um, Charles Foster being a beast where he lives as a badger, a deer, an otter, an urban fox, and even attempts to, to be a swift. Um, and also marshmallow laser feeds been doing a lot of work in this area where they um, down at the Eden project, they've got the uh, they have the uh, wood white web where you can you can actually see this intelligence underneath your feet. And I think the the real power of seeing something like the mycelium and this uh, <coughs> this connection to the trees um, is that you know when they're in abundance they immediately share with everything else around them and if we can see that that's the, the standard way of being under the under the earth then surely that may affect the way we we live in our capitalist uh, materialist um, understanding of the, of the individual which is just toxic and, and is a cold sack um so so we test these prosthetics with, with a variety of users, including the neurodiverse, because we think there's intelligences that we're misframing. So for instance, at Ravensbourne, where I work, if you're not dyslexic, you're not allowed in, because there's a direct link between neurodiverse, I mean, the you know, dyslexia and creativity. You know, these people may be more, so it's about reframing what we call disabilities. I was joking about not letting people that aren't dyslexic into mm -hmm. Ravensbourne, but you get the idea that we need to reframe things that we call Diverse or whatever it is, I think there's just different ways of being in the world that we, we may not empathize with or understand. So it's an interesting, iterative cycle. And, uh, we're producing these frameworks that can be uh, rolled out into other contexts. We're testing these things uh, in, in mm -hmm. these sorts of uh, workshops. And then we, we're going to run retreats where you can be these different uh, experiences for a number of days. Thank you. So, for example, um, so this is our process with the octopus. So that's where uh, we started. Uh, so we collected all the information, we interviewed people, we did a lot of research around the octopus, and then we sort of performed a design synthesis where we took all of that research and tried to work out what are the key aspects of being an octopus or what makes an octopus alternative intelligence really important. And if they were the top of the hierarchy, if, if the octopus had the ultimate intelligence, what would that be? Um, and it's really fascinating because they have um, a totally unique evolution of a nervous system. They have a brain at the end of each arm. Uh, they can taste with each arm. They can see light <laughs> through each arm. So if we were to imagine, right, well, these are the most uh, intelligent creatures, what would that be like? Um, so we found that they're curious, they're playful, they have mischief and craft, um, they have tacit knowledge and memory, ability to learn and curious, adaptive and flexible, and novel problem solving. Uh, so, so from those top octopus values, um, I looked into tacit knowledge. So if I was really seeing octopus as an intelligence, what would it be? And likely it would be a tactility. So a, a sensing and feeling, and if this was an intelligence, what would, how could we uh, improve that in humans and explore that a sort of kinesiological intelligence? So uh, we made whiskers. Um, so I went through many iterations of making these whiskers, um, trying to adapt the human skin to be more tactile and more sensitive. Um, and next slide. And then I made these prosthetics. Uh, so these are the initial uh, prosthetics that kicked everything off. Um, and then, and then I made these whiskers kits and sent them off to neurodiverse people. So people in the neurodiverse community uh, and performers who are partially blind. Um, and makers who I believe have a high level of tactile intelligence already to find out what do different people respond to. And then we ask them to hack the whiskers as well. So giving that feedback loop of how can we improve this based on their experience. Um, so one girl, next slide. For example, one girl um, attached all of her whiskers together so she had to sort of, um, and she said, I really had to focus creating a unique mindful experience. I found myself rediscovering common objects in a whole new way. And it felt like a whole new sensation. 
and she connected all the whiskers together so she could touch a whisker on her arm and then she'd feel it on her face and she was she felt like this was making her more uh, tactile intelligence and so the next one is forests so we're like what would it be like to have the intelligence of a forest so the first initial prototype we made for this is the wind whiskers um, so these are whiskers that respond to the wind um, and one partially sighted participant particularly like these because she's like I sense what the wind is feeling but also other people can see what I'm sensing um, and experience and have some sort of idea of what I'm experiencing based on how they see the sort of wind moving through the uh, whiskers. So, so yeah, we're really interested in this uh, mycelium network and how we sense like it. And I think you know, there's what I, what I envision is an ability um, to see. You know, how do we how do we actually visualize this stuff? You know, I don't I don't want a CGI. I want a digital twin. So when you look with mixed reality, you actually look down, you see the real uh, interactions going on, and, that, and that's a real challenge. And I know Marshall has <coughs> done this a lot of this thinking already. Um, um, we're gonna we're gonna go and see the video and then we'll have something. So, so this is the yeah this is the dark side. Ah, it's a shame it's not playing the sound. Um, I it out. We share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or die Trees may look like solitary individuals, but the ground beneath our feet tells a different story. Trees are secretly talking, trading and waging war on one another. They do this using a network of fungi that grow around and inside their roots. The fungi provide the trees with nutrients and in return they receive sugars. But scientists have found this connection runs far deeper than first thought. By plugging into the fungal network, trees can share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or dying may dump their resources into the network, which might then be used by healthier neighbours. Plants also use fungi to send messages to one another. If they're attacked, they can release chemical signals through their roots, which can warn their neighbours to raise their defences. But like our internet, the wood wide web has its dark side too. Some orchids hack the system to steal resources from nearby trees. And other species, like the black walnut, spread toxic chemicals through the network to sabotage their rivals. Arboreal cybercrime aside, scientists are still debating why plants seem to behave in such an altruistic way. The hidden network creates a thriving community between individuals. When you're next in woodland, you might like to think of trees as part of a big superorganism, chatting and swapping information and food under your feet. So just to finish then, so we are building this framework. Yeah. 
the trees with nutrients and in Um, the prosthetics we're working out at the moment are uh, around the mycelia network and trying to find ways to explore that um, with the extra research that we have, uh, which actually suggests it's less like the internet and more like hormones in the body. Um, so we've been thinking about how we can make physical prototypes that explore that idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, um, the key thing we want to avoid is you know, replacing imagination not with computer animation and with common means, but with, with these prosthetics, we want to we don't want them to alienate us even more. So I think it's a really it's really a case of citizen science and trying with different groups and different genders and different age, ages and etc. So um, yeah, and I think any any additional tools we have to be um, careful to bring to the table because we they can have unknown consequences. Um, so you know. Half the time, my problem with being in the world is my, my addiction to my phone. So if we can somehow use a prosthetic to disable me using my phone, <laughs> but disable the human, you know, the, the addicted human, the, the trans human. And create ambiguous games. Ambiguous games, ambiguous games yeah, exactly. Um, complexity, you know, complexity management, I think is a big one, but we're not, uh, you know, we're not able to, to live uh, and sort of function properly. Is working. Um, so yeah, and you know, it, it's, it's as as uh, we've discussed already. It's, it's what? How do we observe more? You know, it's like you really you really notice something when you draw it. You know, if you take a photo of something, it's very different. So how do we how do we embed ourselves more uh, in the world and use these uh, experiences to to really be in presence? And use more of our senses and just our eyes. If going back to the photography idea, yeah, exactly. I think it's it's about engaging the imagination, imagining imagining those complex nutrient exchanges, and um, imagine what it's like to be that octopus where you're you're tasting with your with your arms. Mm. Just imagine that. Um, so maybe mushrooms can't move and neither can trees. So maybe we just need to bury ourselves. <laughs> 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 Um, and a great quote here from Satori, David Satori, who's a living um, legend of my, my colleagues. My colleagues he's, uh, he, he was about to give it all up because he thought nobody cared, there's nobody listening. And uh, I managed to convince him to not give it up and now he's, he's got his own business, uh, spreading spores, becoming, you know, working in service of the mushroom. Um, so when you can read nature and decipher the stories of why things look the way they do, you can slip into the memory trace of the animals that left the tracks. The same is true for intuitive herbalists, and probably too true for indigenous mycologists. So, you know, we're, we're entering a bit of a crisis in, in the West, and I think the, the, the indigenous people know how to forage, they know how to swipe when, when all the, the, the food chains break down. So how can we learn from uh, these ancient knowledges as well? Uh, future plans for today or future plans in the next five months? Just whenever. So timeline today, uh, come and join us, uh, see some of the uh, prosthetics that we've been working on, try them out and make your own, come and hack. I've got more tools, uh, a massive suitcase full of tools that, and things that we can hack um, and explore go through the process. And in the next five months, we're planning to make more, more hack sessions, uh, more like perhaps a few daily retreats where we can sort of start developing these games, start developing these kits um, and get feedback and data from that to make better ones. So join us. Yeah, that workshop's in 15 minutes or two minutes. Oh yeah. That's Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, thank you very, very much indeed. I shall never walk through a woods again without thinking about what's under my feet <laughs> and uh, what they're all doing to each other and whatever. Um, what was, what was the phrase? Arbitorial cyber crime or something? Yeah. What okay. cool phrase? I think keep, keep that one. Um, but yes, uh, definitely. So we've got a couple of minutes. Would anyone like to ask Carl and Rosie a question? John? I'll have to bring the microphone back to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is probably more a couple of sort of thoughts slash comments rather than a question as such. But there might be a question in there. So, one is I was kind of thinking about how uh, trees seem to be very slow in the way they kind of move and grow and respond to things. Um, and I was wondering if that's kind of like that temporal dimension is something that might be interesting to think about. The other thought was that uh, this idea of kind of being able to experience different forms of sort of plant consciousness could be sort of expanded if you think about James Lovelock's idea of the Gaia hypothesis, where the whole earth is kind of an organism, mm -hmm. is there a way to experience that mm -hmm. as a form of consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, which would kind of fit with some of the sort of ecological themes uh, that you're looking at? And then possibly the question that would be uh, how, how are you sort of considering this in relation to things like sort of psychedelics? where obviously things like sort of ayahuasca and stuff have this dimension where you have sort of shamanic rituals which are in a sense kind of giving people plant, plant consciousness mm. through elicit. I'm sure we're both going to have some things to say about <laughs> <laughs> right. Please. Fantastic um, points, John. So yeah, I think to answer the first one about time, I think, um, yeah, there's um, actually both some of the guys that's built something called the Unwatch, it's a watch that you, it's an analog, imagine an analog watch face that you never you never look at it so it's uh, you, you feel it through vibration so you're literally burning time into your wrist and you turn time into a sense hmm. and the, the idea behind it is well the guy now makes perfect pancakes because he knows time time is no longer an abstract concept it's something he knows he knows his sense and then what he's doing is um you know um attempting to do what we do with youtube so you know when you can put it on 1.5 speed and then it's like get used to 1.5 speed and get you know get the same content and this he thinks you can do the same time to speed it up or slow it down and actually give people the ability to have say 30 percent more time because their perception of time can be adjusted this is the theory so something like that a prosthetic that would adjust your sensation of time or there's certain psychedelics that will drastically time dilate Again, in quite sort of a standard way for almost everyone that does them, there's this sense of you know, time going very slowly. So, and then I think also breath work you know, could be another non drug alternative to, to messing around with time. So, lots of things that you could do in combination with some of these prosthetics. Uh, and yeah, the, the question about um, becoming a global consciousness, I think that would be represented by something like Five and the ODMT, which is a Mbufa or various toad in the Scenarian Desert. Um, you can have these non-dual experiences where you literally become tall, you know, and that again could be a very powerful uh, intervention in the uh, Great comments. I've been taking notes. Um, so interesting thing about time is that when I was exploring uh, IQ tests and intelligence and what humans think, I tell intelligence is speed comes up a lot. How fast you can do something is equated to how smart you are, how high your IQ test IQ is, is, which I think is ridiculous. I don't think how I don't think your your how well your brain is processing information at what speed. It just shows how like you are to a computer more than how intelligent you are. So that's that's my thought. So I would be interested in making games that yeah, let's bury ourselves. Let's be like okay, let's do things really slowly, like a train and value that instead. Um, and for psychedelics, it's an interesting idea. I think at the moment, what I'm really interested in is can we explore those states without adding anything, or what's it like without without psychedelics, or without electronics, or without anything mechanical? And then once we've done this testing, maybe we'll say, actually, we're going to add audio to this because that's going to improve it. But I, I almost don't want to add anything 
until we've sort of worked out what would actually be. If we can do these prosthetics with just a wooden spoon and it works, then that's great. But if we want to add add something, then we'll see that afterwards. But it's a really interesting idea. Any other any other questions? One one over here. <coughs> Uh, you started your talk talking about compassion. Have you thought of other ways to introduce compassion? I mean, just like nature itself, because we're so estranged from nature. Look, look at this room. There's one natural thing in here. And if we walk in our cities, it's very rare. We may have a fenced-in tree someplace. But how can a child or an adult, for that matter, develop a relationship to nature if nature isn't present in their lives? You know, like just like old-fashioned poets go <coughs> out into the countryside and watch a tree and watch the moon or something. Like, but, like yeah. what role does nature play in, in your experiment? Well, one thing we thought is, can we actually run this workshop in a building? We were actually like, oh no, we can't do it because we're inside. And then we're like, no, we can do it. Um, I've actually brought some miniature fans to sort of like, oh, we can make the wind with some electric fan. <laughs> but yeah, the, a core part of this project is really trying to get that uh, compassion or empathy because we're trying to say that nature has the ultimate intelligence. So we're going to do things slowly. We're going to have these ambiguous games that value nature's values instead of our values. So instead of valuing speed and efficiency and remembering numbers and all these things that we test animals as well, uh, to try and do to see how intelligent they are we're saying no actually the biggest intelligence is tactility or um being able to contact each other more like a mycelium network so we're hoping that by yeah putting those values at the top and having nature centered design instead of human centered design that we try and get out of our own assumptions. So you're saying we're looking at the wrong parameters to judge people and to judge intelligence. This is an ongoing problem, yeah. but again, you, you make a new IQ test, basically. So we're, we're trying to avoid that by making it ambiguous, instead of being like, oh, we've made these new rules. We're the experts, we're humans, we've made these new rules to judge by nature's uh, plan. So yeah, we're trying to avoid that. Um, by making it somewhat ambiguous so it's not a test how like an octopus are you out of 10. So yeah, it, it's problematic. That's the idea. One, one last quick question. Um, Thank you so much. Um, this is really great and I completely share where you're coming from. Uh, the, the whole materialist consumerist society that we've become and everything. Um, but just adding to the point, um, my wife uh, at, at one point had a huge number of house plants mm -hmm. to the point where everything was covered. Um, and she would always talk about these plants as her children. And the fact that, you know, when she hadn't watered them and they were droopy and shriveled, and as soon as you water them, they'd be, you know, the leaves would start again coming out. And again, it, it, it's that connection with nature in terms of what you're seeing around you, what you're smelling, because smell again is very difficult to convey digitally, um, even with all the technologies that we have now um, and temperature. Um, so I think, yeah, being, I guess, more surrounded rather than going in the ground, maybe taking the trees out of the ground, possibly looking at um, things like the vertical forest that they have in Singapore. I think they're doing some experiments where you have these huge buildings with skyscrapers covered in plants and so on. So um, more of a co-design methodology yeah. where you're in together in the same space. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think, I think the danger is that we're entering a post-nature world. Mm. And I think the, the nature nature literacy you know if you're, if you're like in japan they have like bird song on the underground and just to sort of give that sort of old memory of what it used to be so i think that the, the, the danger is real and i think people there because of that so a lot of people are becoming more than they're saying they're saying and they, and they just realize they can you don't you won't live you won't live very long you know, if you've already done so there's half a million japanese mostly young men 
And when I studied that in 2015, it was like, no, it's a Japanese problem. It means, you know, it's very, very difficult to, um, to when people are cut off from nature to get them back in. So I think, yeah, and, you know, whatever it can take to, I mean, I think this is, this is the danger as well with the metaverse is that, you know, we take a picture of a flower and a real flower dies. And it's, it's ready player one where we're just like, the real world just is a base layer for jumping into VR. So this is, I don't think it's happening now. I think that people really, really now, especially there's a backlash against the map metaverse already, whereas even look at Zuckerberg and Meta has crashed yeah. and Google continues to do so, which is great you know, in lots of ways because in his version of the metaverse, what we want, we want. So it's like, how do we build our own metaverse but base it on nature? And maybe we don't, maybe it's not digital, maybe it's just you know, ways of uh, being hyper human, maybe it's ways of reenacting yeah. ancient knowledge, ancient senses that we've lost mm -hmm. um, because of the technologies that we've adopted that have just been toxic and bad. But I think so. I think so. I've got a second job as a healthcare coordinator, and I see this in the younger generation, it's not specific to Japan, mm -hmm. it's happening here now, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very frightening. <laughs> Well, I think uh, we'll uh, wind that one up for, for now. Um, Carl and uh, Rosie are off to do their workshop next door. I expect they'll take one or two kids who you look in screaming with them, but uh, hopefully some of you will stick around here for uh, next speaker. Uh, and, uh, and would you like to come out here and set yourself up? And,